you. Thank you, Bianca, for your kind presentation, and thank you, everyone, for attending. So, uh, yes, today I will present our work uh, that was done to obtain, uh, to analyze seawater turbidity from uh, Sentinel-2 images. Uh, okay. So, first of all, I will uh, say something about turbidity, what turbidity is, and why we study for water quality purposes. I will recall briefly some um, satellite remote sensing um, basics information uh, that make it useful for water quality analysis. And then I will go deeper into our uh, case study. I will present all the steps uh, for the study that goes from atmospheric correction to band analyze up to the realization of turbidity maps. I will show some results and get to some conclusions. So what is turbidity? I think we're all pretty familiar about turbidity, but what is it exactly? Turbidity is a measure of the amount of light scattered by the particles that are in water. For seawater, uh, changes in turbidity are due to, for example, uh, algal blooms. Or, um, but the most relevant uh, contribution to changes in turbidity is due to sediment. For example, sediment coming from river flows especially when related to anthropogenic activities like beach nourishment or uh, uh, dredging activities, the increase of turbidity can be associated to negative environmental effects. That's why turbidity is one of the parameters that is considered for uh, European legislation for water quality monitoring. In situ, turbidity monitoring is done uh, by a probe as said, uh, turbidity is not the only measure that is taken, so usually it's uh, measured with the multiparametric probe that also um, measure other parameters. The measured turbidity depends, of course, by the particles that are present in water, but also um, on the instrument, on the wavelength of the light and the angle at which the detector is positioned. For example, nephelometric turbidity unit, NTU, measures the scatter light at 90 degrees from the incident light beam, measured with a white light. In situ monitoring offers high accuracy data, but it is of course time consuming and offers uh, uh, information that is sparse both in time and uh, space. On the other hand, uh, remote sensing and Earth's observation can provide uh, uh, fast and um, economic when we consider um, free available data, and most of all, a synoptic view of the situation. Um, remote sensing, and in particular optical remote sensing, measures the, en the solar energy that is reflected by the Earth's surface. The different objects and features of the Earth's surface have a unique spectral response called spectral signature. And this is the, the um, let's say, the fact that we can use to study um, seawater surface. In fact, uh, the seawater surface has um, a, spectral, um, a spectral signature that depends on the optical significant constituents. There are phytoplankton pigments, uh, color dissolved organic matter, and suspended matter. We can see in the right image the um, spectral signature of the different components, and we can notice that uh, water absorbs energy of uh, most of the wavelength, while the presence of chlorophyll uh, oops, sorry, um, causes a, a small peak of reflect reflectance in the green area. But sediments is the particle that causes the higher values of reflectance, not only in the visible spectrum, but also in the near infrared region. So the aim of the study was to retrieve turbidity information in a study area. The study area is here reported. Uh, it's in the North Iranian Sea. Uh, that includes the uh, Liguria region and Tuscany region. You can see here the study area, and uh, it's a very complex area from the turbidity point of view because uh, it comprehends many different sources of turbidity. We have in the northern part a marine protected area, so it's, it's supposed to be a very clean uh, type of water. But then we have, um, yeah, uh, I don't know how to make this, this work. Anyway, and we have a harbor. La Spezia Harbor, uh, we have uh, two river mouths, Magra River Mouth and Arno River Mouth. 
And again, we have another harbor that is Livorno Harbor. So it's a very complex system. Um, we use uh, uh, in situ turbidity measure collected from 2015 up to 2021 by the Regional Agency for the Environmental Protection of Liguria, where I work, and Tuscany, according to the official monitoring programs. Uh, turbidity is measured in nephilometric turbidity units. You can see on the uh, bottom left image the histogram of the turbidity data. This data set is uh, not uh, just the data that were collected in these six years, but uh, the data um, corresponding to the availability also of satellite image, because satellite image is not always available. We can uh, immediately notice how the data set is very unbalanced towards low data, and especially data lower than 3 NTU, which means clear water. This is also due to the fact that the high turbidity um, events are associated to intense meteorological events, uh, during which the sea condition are not, um, does not allow in situ monitoring, or the sky, the sky is cloudy, so uh, the satellite uh, information is not available. No, oh, this one. We use the Sentinel-2 multispectral instrument products because of its uh, time and uh, spatial resolution, especially in the visible bands, we have a spatial resolution of 10 meters. Uh, the products are available in um, areas of fixed size, called tiles, and our study area is uh, totally included in one tile. The revisit time in this area is about three days. Sentinel-2 provides uh, data since 2015, but only since March 2018, the data are provided as so-called level two, that is bottom of atmosphere reflectance. We know in fact that the atmosphere interfere with the sunlight and uh, changes the spectral signature. So the, the effects of the atmosphere are basically absorption. For example, UV ray are blocked by ozone while carbon dioxide stops the thermal infrared and uh, by scattering, due uh, mostly by aerosol particles. So the so-called top of atmosphere reflectance, which is the one that uh, is um, measured by the uh, sensor, is composed by the bottom of atmosphere or Earth surface reflectance plus the contribution of atmosphere. So this is the, the scheme of our work. So first of all, we collected, of course, the in situ data, and we collected the satellite data for the same day. Um, as said, we had to remove all the data with the presence of cloud. And then, because not all the data, Sentinel data were available as a bottom of atmosphere information, we had to do some atmospheric correction. And three open source softwares were tested and compared, the QGIS, the GRASSGIS, and the SNAP. And the uh, results of the bottom of atmosphere obtained reflectance were compared to the level two Sentinel-2 data because we wanted to have a, a homogeneous data set to use. So once the best uh, method was identified and um, ho the whole data set was used to identify which bands were more correlated to turbidity, and we all only considered the bands that are known to be correlated to particles in water that we saw before. So we found uh, calibrated and validated a turbidity model that was used finally to obtain some turbidity maps. About atmospheric correction, just a few words. Um, there are two main groups of uh, atmospheric correction methods. The first one, and is the easiest one, are the image-based approaches. They consist of the subtraction of a constant value from each pixel of the processed image. So this is a faster way because it doesn't require any information about the atmosphere. Basically, it is based on the idea that uh, the darkest pixel in the image um, have a reflectance, that is the lowest reflectance of the image, that is due not because of the, the reflectance of the object, but the effect of the atmosphere. So that is the value that is considered at the atmospheric effect and is removed by the other pixel. The physically based approach instead, they rely on the use of a radiative transfer model to accurately compute the atmospheric effects. Uh, examples are the 6S method, which is used by GRASSGIS, and the LibraTran method, which is used by SNAP. Of course, they need some uh, atmospheric information at the time and location of the image acquisition. 
So what parameters are required for the two methods? Uh, of course, some uh, sensor and solar geometries information, uh, the date and time of acquisition, and the position of the image. But these data are easy to find because they are provided by the metadata file. We need the mean target elevation above sea level, which is usually derived by um, digital elevation model. And then we need the most difficult one are the data related to the atmosphere, so atmospheric model and aerosol model. A very important uh, parameter is the aerosol optical depth or thickness at 550 nanometers. This is a dimensionless parameter that is related to the amount of um, aerosol that is present in the vertical column of the atmosphere above the target. The higher the IOD, the less sunlight passes through the atmosphere. So for SNAP, uh, this is a parameter that is automatically calculated by the software uh, from visibility using dark reference areas. If no dark pixels are present in the image, uh, a forecast the datum obtained from Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service <coughs> is used. While from GRASS-GIS, we used um, an IOD parameter uh, estimated from the aerosol robotic network. It is possible to search for the nearest measurement site or the site that has the uh, atmospheric characteristic uh, closest to the study area. In our case, we uh, identified five stations, uh, ISPRA and Modena, because they are the closest to the study area, but they're not coastal um, sites, so they have high altitude. So we also analyzed three other stations, um, Rome, Naples, and Palma de Mallorca in Spain, because they are uh, at the coast, so they should have more similar characteristics. From the image on the left, uh, we have an example of the AOD daily variability for the different stations. What we can immediately notice is that the values are not constantly available. For example, for that date, the data from Naples stations were not available. On the right image, we can see the effect of the AOD parameter on the atmospheric correction in grass GIS. Um, for, again, for just one day, an example, and uh, one band. Uh, what we can notice is that uh, changing the AOD parameter changes a lot the uh, bottom of atmosphere reflectance obtained. And uh, most of all, we can see that the AOD parameter of uh, 0 0.15, which is the one that we would uh, use by looking at the stations, is not actually the one that gives us the best uh, mm, b uh, bottom of atmosphere values compared to the level 2, Sentinel-2. So um, results obtained with the different uh, softwares were compared to the level 2 um, data. We can say that the QGIS is very fast, but is not very accurate, at least for this case. While the GRASS uh, GIS uh, software, which is a physically based approach, it can be very accurate, but uh, in our case, because we didn't have information about the AOD parameter, it's very difficult to use. On the other hand, SNAP, uh, because it evaluates automatically the AOD parameter, was very uh, efficient and actually accurate with compared to level two um, data. So the bottom of atmosphere uh, reflectance obtained either from directly from level two or after atmospheric correction was then used to identify which bands are more correlated to turbidity. Again, as said, uh, just the visible and near infrared bands were considered. And we can see here uh, that uh, the bands in the visible range are the ones that are most correlated to turbidity. So they were used to identify an index, were combined together to identify an index to relate it to turbidity. The correlation is uh, reported here. Um, you the, to validate the correlation, um, a validation data set was used, and uh, you can see here the indexes R square, root mean square error, and mean absolute error were calculated to see to evaluate the accuracy. And um, you can see that the correlation that was found is uh, linear with respect to the index, but is actually non-linear with respect to the single bands. So the relationship was finally used to obtain turbidity maps. Um, you can see on the left image the RGB composite or true color image for um, 
one specific day and on the right image we have the uh, turbidity map corresponding to the same day. Well, of course, we can notice that the land is uh, evaluated as very high turbidity levels. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, but we can clearly see that uh, the shapes are of the turbidity plumes are well represented. The values are, um, are uh, good values. I mean, they uh, are um, physically um, good values. But even though they are very... Um, correlated to the calibration data set that we had. I mean, we cannot uh, think to estimate values that are lower than the minimum value that we had or higher than the maximum value that we had for the calibration data set. This is another example of a turbidity map. Uh, again, we can see how the turbidity plumes are well represented. I just wanted to recall you that this is the Arno River and we have here another river. Uh, what we can see, though, in this, in this image is that there are some effects due to the, the image, the Sentinel-2 image. We can also notice, not so well, but we can also notice them in the RGB composite. This is probably due to the fact that the Sentinel-2 image is actually not thought for uh, application on, sea, on water. Uh, for example, they don't consider uh, sanglint uh, correction, which is done instead with the Sentinel-3 uh, ocean land color instrument. To conclude, uh, some conclusion about the atmospheric correction. So as we said, the semi-empirical physically based model to obtain water quality information from optical data required the use of bottom of atmosphere reflectance, which has to be obtained from atmospheric correction. From our experience, the physically based methods uh, are perform better. However, the uh, IOD param or in general the atmospheric information that are required can make it difficult to apply. Sentucor from ESA was found to be the most suitable for our case study. To identify correlation, uh, we think we perform good, so we can actually say that um, Earth observation can be an important tool to support water quality monitoring. It, it provides uh, especially wide information uh, at significant resolution in space and time. The relationship shows a good agreement between measures and prediction. However, as said, it is highly dependent on the data set available. So, of course, it could benefit from new data, but uh, they are very hard to obtain because they are um, I'd say uh, limited to the sea condition and from cloud condition. To limit the effects of the atmosphere correction and improve the complexity of the relationship, for example, including more bands, uh, machine learning techniques are now under development. And before concluding and thanking you all, uh, I would like to make an open call saying that if any of you uh, works with the water quality and turbidity, it's very welcome to cooperate and test our model with your data. Thank you so much.